Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our regular YouTube series, Out of IBM Research. I am Katya Moskvich, the communications lead of, communication, of uh, IBM Research Europe. And as usual, I am here with you um, in Zurich, in our uh, Zurich labs uh, in Switzerland. You know, it's, um, it's actually quite funny. When I mention that I work for IBM to people, often what they think about is computers. And of course, you know, it's true that IBM, this company that is like more than 100 years old now, is a pioneer in computing. Of course, it made computers mainstream, brought them to people's homes, and it's also been leading developments in AI, in artificial intelligence, and lots of you probably have heard of, um, I don't know, uh, IBM Watson Computer, for example, winning uh, the Jeopardy game in, I think it was 2011, right? Uh, but what's also important to remember is that for like three quarters of a century now, IBM has also been doing research, really, really cool research, of course, in, in AI, yes, but also quantum computing. You know, this, this wonderful thing here is a model of a quantum computer. And uh, if you, some of you haven't yet seen our um, webinars about quantum computing specifically, I, uh, I advise that you do search and go back and uh, watch one, for example, uh, from February, where we explain what quantum computing actually is. But we are also doing really cool research in security and hybrid cloud. So uh, a lot of um, quite amazing, amazing uh, breakthroughs come, come out of our labs. Um, and of course, you know, one may argue that it's just fundamental research, but at the same time, uh, pretty soon uh, a lot of this will be turned into applications. And uh, this is exactly the case, um, hopefully, uh, of what we will be talking about today. We'll be talking about light, right? Light is all around us. So, you know, light from the sun, light in our bedroom from electricity, candlelight, um, I don't know, campfire light where we grill marshmallows or whatever it is you guys like to grill, starlight from faraway stars, uh, much further than our sun. And there is one element that is, um, you know, common to all these examples, and it's the photon. So this is exactly what our chat is going to be about. The photon is the quantum of electromagnetic field, the fundamental particle of light. And while today our gadgets run on electricity, the guys you will hear about in just a few seconds here um, have developed actually a, a device, an optical device, that could make our gadgets run on light instead. So before I introduce um, our speakers today, as usual, I urge all of you watching us right now to please, please send us your questions through the YouTube chat. We will try to answer as many of them as we can live. Uh, and we, thank you, uh, <laughs> so we also have our experts in the chat who will be answering them uh, behind the scenes here in the chat directly. So um, joining me today are Darius Urbanus, a physicist here at IBM Research Zurich, and also Pavlos Lagudakis from the University of Southampton in the UK and Skoltech in Russia. Hi, guys. Hi, hey, Katya. <laughs> so um, first question for you, Darius. So I'll start with the questions, but I hope our audience will pitch in and send uh, their questions as well. Uh, Darius, but a question for you. So, you know, as we're going to be talking about light, in your view, what's so special about light? Why would light be better than electricity when it comes to our gadgets? Yeah, so um, imagine like uh, now gadgets are everywhere. So um, and people want faster and uh, better performing gadgets. But if you really look what is present in the moment, like since 15 years ago, the speed of these gadgets is not really improving. So called the dinner scaling is kind of a it's, it's coming to an end. I mean, the, the, we still have many more transistors there on the chips, but the speed is not going anywhere. So that's why people and uh, researchers like we actually are looking at kind of uh, different ways of doing this kind of uh, um, switching. Uh, so trying to use, for example, light. And why is light so interesting? Well, light is very fast and is, uh, can be done very power efficiently. So um, we could imagine speeds maybe that are running like at terahertz rates. And what we are showing now in our p recent paper is that we can really push this, uh, this work even to uh, a very few photons. So ten, 10 times less power consumption than the current uh, 
state of uh, current transistors use. And so maybe you could just elaborate a little bit more on this concept of, uh, you mentioned that the speed of light is very fast. I mean, that that's the fastest you can get, right? So can you just give our audience, I guess, an idea of how fast light actually is and uh, you know wh why we would use it for, uh, for gadgets? Yeah, so uh, um, in the end, like, uh, the, 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 the light is, of course, traveling at, uh, at the speed of light. So, I mean, in our fundamental work that we did, we, we have, uh, we, we, we are using uh, this. Uh, the, the, the is 300,000 meters per second, right? I mean, the, the yeah, actual. Something, yes. So, but uh, in the end, the, the idea is really that we are able to, 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 to run the, 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 the idea is to really have them in the long term to have these devices being switched to the very fast rate so like 1000 times or 100 to like 1000 times faster than the nowadays transistors and prefer and of course at the very uh, low power budget that is like the, the, the really the goal in this research field mm, cool and where did you get the idea to even start working on this yeah so the idea is actually the history behind this is very um uh, interesting um in the lab already in 2014 here in the group we were able to show the first time that uh by using uh specific materials uh we were, we were able to, to, uh, to show so-called bose einstein condensates in, in our devices and uh, at that time, uh, Pavlos Lagudagi is actually uh, connected to us and asking us, uh, well, guys, uh, let's work together and maybe we could, like, let's build something cool. And that's what it came all to in 2019 when we had our Nature Photonics paper where we showed uh, our, all optical logic gates where we, like, build N gates for the, like, uh, at, that operate at room temperature. Back then, of course, we didn't really, like, pay too, pay too much attention to, like, uh, uh, the power efficiency, but this is really what we are doing now. This is all this work that we are really trying to look at this efficiency of this device, so really push like this to a single photon level. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, so you mentioned Pavlos. Why don't we go to Pavlos? And uh, um, Pavlos, could you maybe explain uh, to us a little bit more, I guess, in depth, what this device can do? So Darius already mentioned efficiency and speed. And so what what else can it do? Why Why is it so amazing? Yeah, so uh, first of all, let me tell you about the device uh, itself. So uh, this device is uh, it's a, it's a small, relatively small device that, that acts like an optical cavity. So if I, if I have, for example, an image of a cavity, you have two mirrors into which you confine light. Yeah, so you bring light and you squeeze it in very small volume. And uh, inside this cavity, you also have a material that interacts with light. So you have something that absorbs light and emits light. And when this process happens, practically you mix light with matter and you create a new type of a hybrid particle, which we call polaritons. So it is a new type of particle and you can see this as um, a droplet of liquid light. So this Bose-Einstein condensate that uh, Darius was talking before, it is nothing else than a droplet of this new type of particles that we call polaritons, which have exotic properties. It is actually something like the fifth uh, type of matter, if you like. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, exotic state now, once you can start interacting with it, you can start playing with uh, these exotic properties. And um, what, what we did, if we can see, for example, the cavity, uh, a schematic of a cavity, um, uh, what we do on this device, we shine light, we create this uh, droplet of uh, light, and then we can now manipulate it using down to single photons. So you can use this, for example, as a switch. You can use one photon to create this liquid droplet of light, which then results to many photons coming out of the device. Yeah. So it is like a light amplifier, like you have a sound amplifier, Imagine a light amplifier with one photon, you create a lot of photons that carry the same properties. Yeah. So this is, uh, and, and this is, this is the type of the switch, which then you can use to amplify signals. And of course, there are many, many applications that carry on from there. Uh, switching and amplification, they are the two properties that are connected. So we see here uh, in an image, for example, here, what you see schematically is this kind of cavity 
So this is now a horizontal cavity. You see uh, these blue and red layers, which is like a milfade, if you like. But this kind of milfade confines light in the very small green area in between. And in, in this kind of device, we can send a single photon and we can use a process of amplification uh, which practically creates this polarity and condensates to amplify it and create a lot of photons coming out. And we can do this very fast. So this is what Darius was saying. We can do it down to terahertz rates. So please carry on. Wow. So, so that's, yeah, that's, you said, um, if I understood correctly, a liquid droplet of light. Is that right? That's yes. I think that's, I don't know what our audience uh, is, is thinking there, but to me, it's completely, you know, impossible to imagine how can you create a, a liquid droplet of light, right? It's like already light. Um, I remember this whole debate uh, I was reading about in, in high school when I was studying physics about the, you know, um, wave particle duality of light, right? People didn't know for the longest time whether light was a particle or a wave or both or what. And, and now you guys are adding uh, this, fifth state of meta into the mix that's uh i think you're just yes. complicating complicating things even more <laughs> no actually we we, we simplified uh, in some way i would say because uh, for the audience if you have two laser pointers yes and you cross the beams of two laser pointers unlike uh, star wars they don't actually touch each other you see no interaction yes so light with light in free space does not interact this saber swords of lasers actually you can you cross one pointer through the other but now by adding a matter component to light and creating this kind of liquid light now you add interactions in the system so practically light interacts more efficient with light and that's how then you can use this to manipulate information if you like. Wow, I think you just completely killed the Star Wars there for me uh, forever. <laughs> and we should invite George Lucas uh, for <laughs> to to watch a replay of of, of the discussion. Um, but speaking of lasers, though, so you you work uh, with lasers, right? So this 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 work involves lasers, if I understand correctly. And uh, funny enough, um, I, I don't know if anybody watching us right now is based in Russia, but you are in Russia now, right? And it's it was the the Soviets that pioneered laser research uh, half, a, half a century ago, right? So I just wonder how it feels for you to kind of work on, uh, on lasers in Russia, uh, you know, being, being, being in the country where that pioneered this really cool invention. Yes, actually in, uh, in Skoltek, this is a new university in Moscow, which was established in collaboration uh, with MIT. Uh, ah, this is a view of the lab, which uh, we set up uh, in 20, 2016 we started we moved actually into the building in 2016 and we set up a lab which is dedicated to hybrid photonics so practically this kind of liquid light uh, its fundamental properties and applications and uh, in russia they have as you say a lot of history on lasers with the semiconductor laser and the, the late professor alferov who actually visited us in the lab so the inventor of the semiconductor laser he was there when we were setting up, super excited about the, you know, that this research is really moving forward. And yes, we are using lasers in our devices. As you saw in the lab, there is lots of equipment. We are using lasers which are unlike pointers. They use very short pulses. This is really uh, you know, like a, a billionth of a second in width, these pulses. So very narrow pulses of light so that you can do very fast manipulation of information. And what you saw there earlier, it was actually a photo of the of the of the three lead authors of this work. These are uh, three colleagues from Russia who uh, really made this uh, happen in this lab uh, that you saw. And working in Russia, it is actually, uh, especially in Skoltek, it is like working in any in any other leading research institute. Uh, but the advantage for me that I have worked also in Europe for many years is that you know the, the it is the human capital the people have a very strong background a very strong science background so combining experimental physics with very strong theoretical background has been extremely fruitful for us and it really helped dramatically to lead to this uh, discovery that we are discussing today wow yeah super cool because um actually we forgot to to mention that uh, the, this this discovery this optical switch uh, is being the paper is being published in nature uh, 
the um, the leading uh, science journal, right? So that's that's really quite uh, an amazing achievement. Um, and so, um, yeah, if we go back to Darius now, uh, and um, so one one question I would like uh, to ask uh, to ask you, Darius, um, if you could just tell us how close are we to actually, you know, starting using uh, this cool technology, or is it like in the very very early stages right now? Darius? I think Darius might be having technical issues there. So, Pavlos, I don't know if you maybe want to step in. Yes, yes. So, uh, so the, 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 sorry, to, 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 to really go back to your question, can you repeat, please? Yeah, how close are we to actually using this technology? Um, ah, so, this is, this, is, this is a technology at its infancy, yes? So we just discovered that we can actually do this. We can switch uh, this kind of liquid droplets on and off using a single photon. And uh, what we have been very much interested is in the physics behind, in the fundamental science behind that enables this process. So now that we know that the process is there, this is the first stepping, the first step, if you like. Now we are working towards going from having one switch, one transistor, to creating arrays of these transistors, connecting these arrays of these transistors, building, if you like, polariton circuits, so circuits of these liquid light droplets. And from there, you can use then this very fast speed of switching for making some basic operations. If we go many years down the line, 10, 20 years down the line, it is very hard to make accurate predictions, but I can tell you that something that can switch on and off so fast, and if you can have loads of them interconnected in a circuit, you could use it as an accelerator, as a device which performs some specific function, but much faster than any of our current supercomputers. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Cool. Well, and it's also not the first time you're doing this research, right? I mean, specifically this, of course, it's breakthrough, but uh, you've worked with light before, right? Oh, yes, I've been working all my career with light and uh, we started working in polaritonics uh, 20 years ago uh, in this kind of uh, field of uh, liquid light and its uh, applications. But uh, this, uh, this collaboration uh, with IBM that we started a few years ago, it has been extremely fruitful because uh, you have developed some amazing technologies, which then we combine the with the capabilities that we have in our labs, both at Skoltec and at the University of Southampton. Uh, and uh, yeah, in 2019, we had the first all optical transistor operating at room temperature. And now we can show that we can switch it on and off down to almost one photon, if you like. Cool. Well, um, I I wonder if Darius is, is back online now. Maybe we should uh, check if he's there. Darius? Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Wonderful. Yes. Yes. Perfect. So, Darius, um, in in your view, why why is this um, research um, super important? I guess if if you can can just tell us where we are where we are going with this technology and kind of just to pick up on what Pavlos was just explaining, uh, how close we are to making it widely available. Yeah, so unfortunately, I dropped a little bit with uh, Pavlos, but um, I, I can tell like that uh, for for years the people were looking at this uh, light, like the, the the ways how to do switch light with light. Yeah, and the, the really the main challenge there was really that the it, it's very hard to do that. I mean, there, we need to somehow uh, get this interaction going. So I mean, we were looking at the ways how to mediate this interaction that with a very single uh, photon. Like in our case here, we would be able to uh, to, to switch many of those. So uh, yeah, so I think this is really uh, at the moment, like th this work that we are here, uh, what we demonstrated is really like a, a really kind of a groundbreaking step towards the uh, towards the, uh, the 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 future. So I think it's really like uh, motivates like uh, researchers and like uh, the others like uh, the students also to like look into this uh, field. Uh, so yeah, for me it's a uh, fascinating. Absolutely. No, super cool. And uh, I mean, uh, one possibility, and correct me if if um, if I'm wrong, but uh, I guess the possibilities are quite limitless as well. And I wonder if we could actually extend it to quantum computing in the future. What's your view? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
you know, nowadays uh, um, quantum computers, um, they are like, um, I mean, in, in the future, let's say if, if the quantum computers would like to like communicate with the quantum computers, I mean, they, they would need also like to transduce the, the microwave frequencies to optical domain. So, so for example, if these quantum computers start to like kind of communicate with the photons, so maybe at this point, really like in the future, this kind of fast and efficient uh, like uh, switches could maybe help there. But Yet again, I mean, this is very uh, far, far in, in the future. And uh, at the moment, we are really like at the fundamental level where uh, uh, we're really like switching uh, photon with photons with uh, at very low powers. Mm, cool. Um, great. I just, uh, before we go to the next question from me, I just want to encourage the audience to please ask uh, questions in the chat and our chat experts to please pass the questions to our speakers here as well. That would be great if the speakers could also um, answer uh, some of the questions. So if you could, you know, send them our way, that would be, that would be super helpful. Uh, but for now, while we are waiting, um, if I can maybe ask Pavlos the same uh, kind of question on quantum computing, right? Like, because uh, we were chatting before and you had, uh, Quite an interesting uh, explanation, I think, as well, that I think our aud audience uh, may really enjoy. Pavlos? Uh, yes, OK. So, uh, well, you know, there is a lot of discussion about quantum computing, and uh, IBM is pioneering in uh, superconducting uh, qubits quantum computers. There are different platforms from quantum computers, but I think really for the audience, it is like a black box. Uh, so I wanted to give you a, a description of a quantum computer, which I'm using with my children when I tell them that I work on quantum computing. So uh, let's start with a classical computer where we have electronic transistors. When you have an electronic transistor, you're using electrons to transfer bits of information. Yes, so we have bits, one and zero, you have a, a, an electron transfer information or not. And you start building some things by electrons carrying bricks. But when exactly each transistor will switch on and off, we can compensate is not so important. Now, in a quantum computer, you're using qubits. You don't use ones and zeros. And qubits, they, are, uh, they have different properties. They really, for qubits, what really matters is phase, is synchronicity. But practically, when you couple two qubits, they are in phase, they are dancing together, you know, like the arms of Plitseska here when she's dancing ballet. So now when you go from two qubits to uh, many qubits that you want to build, and you don't want to have just hundred, you want to have tens of thousands in order to do something sensible, it is like you are uh, coordinating an orchestra. So a quantum computer would need to have all these qubits singing in phase. It is like all the instruments of an orchestra, each of them can do some, something slightly different, but they all need to be synchronized in some way. Now, with qubits, there is a lot of work, and with quantum computers, a lot of work, different platforms of how we can make more, put more and more qubits and maintain this synchronicity. This is a very big issue now. Now, let's go 10 years down the line where you will have your quantum computers in IBM, and now we have two of these quantum computers. So look at these two quantum computers as two symphonic orchestras. So it is like uh, having an orchestra in the Bolshoi and another one in the new Bolshoi. And you want somehow to synchronize the two. For that, you would need a device or you would need a medium that would transfer, if you like, the beat. So you take a violinist who takes the beat from one orchestra, walks from one uh, concert theater to the next, and then the two orchestras, they are synchronized. But it is very important that the, the phase, the coherence, the synchronicity is not lost while this guy is walking from one orchestra to the other. And the best way to do that is by using photons. Electrons interact very much with other electrons and they, they lose this information of phase, yes? Uh, they desynchronize. But photons, they are very pure. And as I said before, a photon in a free medium does not interact with anything. So it doesn't lose, if you like, the coherence, the beat of the first orchestra. So through these photons, you can connect two quantum computers. And of course, when you are dealing with one photon or few photons, then you have the issue that photons can get lost. And that's where you need this kind of uh, devices where they take one photon and they create many photons with the same properties. So you can amplify, if you like, the bit, transfer it, and make two quantum computers communicate. 
Now we are very far from that. This is really, if you like, this is uh, this is this is in the future. Uh, people can imagine different applications. But since we have now the schematic that uh, we we were just showing, I wanted to say that what we are trying to do now, and if we can go back to the schematic, is that we have this single photon switches, individual ones, and what we are trying to do is to put them in an array where we can connect them together. We are not aiming for millions right now. We are aiming, we are aiming for a few dozens of them where they talk with each other and we build a basic circuit of liquid light droplets as you see on the schematic. Thank you. Wow, that's, uh, that's super cool. And uh, I, I like the colors on the schematic, something I would definitely put on my desktop wallpaper <laughs> for sure. Um, but thank you for that explanation, Paulus. Uh, now we are finally getting questions here for, for you guys. And uh, uh, one here is for Darius. So Darius, uh, could you explain a little bit more in detail what is the environment that the switch uh, actually works in? Is it cryogenic? Is it atmospheric? Is it vacuum? Well, the, the experiment actually was done uh, at room temperature, so ambient conditions. So uh, this material, uh, that we use is really special, uh, so to say. Uh, um, yeah, it supports these uh, light matter interactions uh, yeah, at room temperature, which is like unique to, the, to this, uh, to what we are, to, to this work. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, the whole device is tailored uh, according to that material. Okay, oh, cool, room temperature. Well, that's, uh, that's yeah, even... That, yeah, that's, that's... Exactly, that, that makes life in, easier. <laughs> Exactly, exactly, to, to scale it, I guess, as well in the future, right? Um, and and uh, somebody else is, um, is asking in the chat here, or actually maybe it's, uh, it's the same user here called Lightning Rod, QQQ, very cool nickname, by the way. So Lightning Rod is, actually, is asking, what is the current physical footprint of the switch? Yeah, so um, the devices um, that we, uh, we, we here had is like on the order of 10 microns, which is like um, one-fifth of a uh, humor here in the in diameter but uh, i mean th this is still a very large device if we now compare this to electronics so transistor so and that and transistor could be like 1000 times uh, smaller than uh, than that like than the human here um, diameter but uh, you know you know um uh, despite that uh, i mean uh, there could be also like uh, approaches, you know, in the future where we could really benefit like that, that like that we could, if we could build like circuits that would not really benefit from like the, the, the really the, 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 the size, but let's say we could have a few of these elements, but if they could be, let's say, run very fast and very efficient, I mean, this, this could be also like uh, really a great thing uh, in the future. But yet again, yeah, now it's really like uh, that uh, we are only like thinking about like one and then as Pavlos mentioned, like coupling uh, like three or so and having them like efficiently operated. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Yeah, well, um, let's go back to Pavlos and uh, I've got a question for you uh, now that we are waiting for questions in the chat. What is the switch actually made of? Uh, the, the switch is actually surprisingly for uh, talking about a, a, a transistor, it is made of an organic material. So inside this cavity where we confine light, uh, instead of using uh, your traditional uh, silicon uh, semiconductor, which actually does not interact so well with light and does not emit light, we're using an organic material which was uh, uh, designed very long time ago, uh, more than 20 years. Uh, our colleague uh, Ulrich Seff, uh, from uh, Wuppertal University in uh, Germany, he he designed a polymer, which is a, which is which looks like a ladder practically. So it is a ladder type polymer, which is very robust to its interactions with light, and that actually was one of the key elements that enabled us to to work and do research, very intense research, which lasts for many years on this material uh, in this cavity and really cut come to the demonstration of uh, all optical transistor and single photon suites. And that tells you something about the history of science. You know, I mean, we are very happy with our result now, but it is the result which is based on the research efforts of many people from many different places of the world. Yeah. And in some way, incoherently initially, and then with some coherence, some synchronicity, uh, we start collaborating 
and we come to the to, to, to the outcome, which is this single photon switch that we are discussing now. So it is an organic material from all types of things that IBM would use, yeah. Cool, cool, very cool. And uh, thanks for that. So we've got a, another question here from uh, a user called uh, Shiv Arya. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, what type of light are they using in making the switch? I'm, I'm guessing probably uh, the meaning is probably not making, but in operating the switch. Uh, what what do you guys, how, how would you answer that? Who wants to take it on, Darius? Yeah, so um, 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 so what we are actually using is uh, that um, um, we, we use a kind of like a create a, uh, so we, we excite our, our device, so still we use quite a lot of power to create, uh, 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 to, to, to excite our device, so the power budget is still large. However, then we send a single photon to our device, and that device triggers like an avalanche process. So basically, all these photo, the, the energy that we use to excite this device is in there, and then when this one photon comes, it basically dictates all the rest of the photons that are there already, like uh, in like in excited. So they kind of like uh, we stimulate them. So there's like they go as one uh, uh, in one big group. So they are emitted. So we kind of control with like single photons. We are able to really like uh, you know force the whole group to move together like in phase. Wow. Okay. Um, and and so just again for me to to kind of understand and uh i wonder maybe the audience is also asking themselves this question but so basically this switch would make my phone my computer be much faster right so the pages would load faster or what exactly would actually change like you know if you if you just use an example of technology we have today so um Yes, uh, it, it is true that when we are talking about um, computers, uh, we want them to be faster and faster. And uh, uh, there is, uh, but there are the, the, there are limits. And the kind of device that we made here makes things so fast that would make no difference to any application that has a human interface. Yes, it really goes beyond anything that would make a difference to you. But it is not even aimed for a desktop or a mobile phone, you know, a smartphone or something like that. It is really aimed for a very specific uh, class of uh, computations, if you like, or applications which require very high speeds beyond what we can get now with uh, our current computers or supercomputers. So here I can say, for example, that, you know, many people in the audience will be familiar with uh, uh, Moore's law where we double the number of transistors every two years. But there is another law, which is the so-called uh, Dennard scaling law, which is not so famous because it stopped to apply back in 2005. And that law was the one that was saying that the, the speed is actually doubling every two years. And that stopped back in 2005 with your computers nowadays having more or less the same speed, three to five gigahertz, as it was 15, 16 years ago. So when it comes to speed, there are some hard limits which come mostly from the heat that your processors, your transistors emit. Yeah. And that is actually a severe limitation what, which fixes the speed of electronic transistors. With optical transistors, there is practically, uh, there is very little heat, if you like. We do not have such limitations. So now we can bring the speed of switching from 3 to 5 gigahertz to near a terahertz, yeah? So this is uh, between 100 and 1,000 times uh, faster than the fastest current switch, electronic switch, if you like. And that will have applications, but not on devices like the ones that you refer to. Uh, there are particular sets of data analysis that you want to do, which needs to be very fast when you are looking for correlations of signal. So the kind of devices that we are talking about is not smartphones, but what we call accelerators. Yeah, they accelerate information processing for particular applications. Mm -hmm. OK, cool. And uh, also earlier in the discussion, I, I guess one, one of you, I think, mentioned also the energy consumption, right? So uh, they are faster, but they also consume less energy. Is that right? Yeah. Darius, 
Yeah, so um, indeed, so um, the, the idea of here is really that um, if you compare to regular transistors, that, um, the, 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 the one that we have presented here in our latest research is that uh, it's 10 times, uh, consumes 10 times less power to, 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 to switch com yeah, compared to the, the nowadays transistors, like to the state of the art. And uh, yeah, so um, exactly that, uh, um, and then it's, it really triggers this avalanche process um, yeah, that's uh, that's actually an interesting point because, um, well, you know, at IBM, for instance, as, as you, uh, Darius, you probably know very well, we also work uh, a lot uh, with AI and AI hardware, right? And, uh, you know, for AI specifically, AI is getting more and more sophisticated, but uh, energy consumption is, is also uh, growing. So I wonder, would that work for some AI applications in the future as well? Uh, potentially. Potentially, this is not something that we are uh, having in mind now. Uh, we really need uh, to, to, what we are doing now, we are looking at the basic, the fundamental mechanisms, you know, what it is that gives us this kind of amplification, what makes it so fast, what are the processes that happen in this polymer that I was describing, yes, which allow us now to go beyond what we can do with electronic transistors. So our research for now and for the, a uh, few years uh, ahead, I can tell you that we'll be focusing on the fundamental limitations of applying such a process as a single photon switch to scaling it up. How many of these can we put together? Are there hard limits to that? And when it comes to the power consumption, uh, it is actually 10 to 100 times less consuming the, the energy that we need to put in order to switch this optical switch. So it goes down to an atojoule, and uh, one atojoule, well, what is a joule for the audience? One joule counts uh, energy in physics, and it is if you had, you know, if you had a resistance of one ohm and you pass a current of one amp for one second, that would give you one joule. And the energy that we are using to switch this, it is, uh, it is a quintillion of one joule. So put 18 zeros together and to one at the end, this is the amount of energy that is needed to switch this transistor on and off. So really down to one photon, which is something that we cannot really comprehend in, uh, so easily. We cannot see a single photon so easily, if you like. Uh, we use special devices. Wow, wow, that's uh, super impressive. Um, question from the chat here. Uh, have you guys been successful in making a gadget using light already? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we are working at the moment uh, as well, trying to um, maybe even connect several of those, like uh, integrated them. We are also working with Paulus together to integrate these devices together. So um, like the, the but the, yeah, so the, the gadget would be, I would say not really a gadget, but more like a, a, a chip that could do like gate operates, uh, operations, like we showed like uh, in our previous uh, Nature Photonics paper. But now if you could like uh, push the stores, like uh, uh, use the know-how that we achieved now with this pair, in this work, I mean, we could make them efficiently and, and make this um, efficient logic gates. Yeah, then I mean, that would be the, the I would say the next step. But uh, as a, like the, 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 I would say the gadgets uh, as this, I mean, uh, yeah, so this is hard to imagine currently as is this really a fundamental research, but I mean, you could imagine like, uh, yeah, to have like a few gates uh, that could uh, be run uh, at this uh, low power consumption and uh, very fast. Wow, yeah, um, that's really impressive. Uh, so another question from the chat here, actually quite an interesting one. Is the optical switch analogous to the qubit? And uh, I, I guess in a way, because we were talking about quantum computing, right? And uh, photon is the quantum of uh, electromagnetic field. That will be, yeah, what, what do you guys think? Uh, it is uh, it is not analogous to the qubit at this point. Uh, it is analogous to a bit, if you like. Yeah. So it is analogous to a classical bit. One, zero. So you switch it on, you switch it off. But now you can do this with one photon, with one autojowl, where if you were to use an electronic transistor, you would be switching on and off with 100 times the energy. Yeah, it would require 100 times the energy to switch it on and off. Of course, it sounds like we have uh, already discovered the green agenda for artificial intelligence, etc., etc. 
but there are limitations and people need to be aware that you know such an optical transistor uh, it has issues with scalability we will never we know this from now there are hard limits we will never be able to put trillions of transistors on a microchip yeah we would be putting few hundreds of them few thousand tens of thousands but we would never really reach the scalability and the density of electronic transistors and uh, when it comes uh, when it comes to qubits this is research for the future so it is very early days for us to say if we can use the fact that we are dealing with one photon in order to use this for uh, qubits and quantum computation mm -hmm. okay cool well um actually going back to what we were talking about earlier the, the these really cool particles you were describing uh, uh, pavlos uh, exciton polaritons right so they are technically classified as bosons right and i i remember <laughs> I visited CERN a couple of times, and of course, you know, um, the uh, what what CERN is most known for uh, is the famous Higgs boson, right? Um, so, what's uh, how you know similar are, are these particles to say the Higgs or or other bosons? From a physicist point of view, they are very similar. So, uh, a Higgs boson is a, you know an elementary particle. A photon is a boson. Yeah. So, a photon is. A, uh, when we say a single photon, what is a photon? It is the smallest packet of energy that you can create at a particular color of light, yeah, at a particular frequency of light. So it is the smallest quantum of energy that you can have, packet of energy. Quantum is a packet, practically. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a photon is a boson in the same way with the Higgs boson, which, uh, which actually has a, a, a very counterintuitive property. So in nature, it is very simple. This is a, you know, a very simple distinction. There are two types of particles. There are fermions and there are bosons. People understand of electrons and protons. These are fermions. You cannot take two electrons and put them together. They repel each other. But when you deal with photons and bosons in general, they like to be at the same state. Bosons are much more loving particles. You know, they like to occupy exactly the same state. We call it a quantum state. And uh, this is really part of the, uh, the, the, the magic that we used in order to create these suites. So bosons, if you have one boson and there is a possibility for more bosons to come and occupy the same state, they will do that. And they will create a macroscopic state, you know, a, a group of bosons that they behave all together like one. So it is back to being in concert. Yeah, they are all synchronized. They are all characterized by the same way. And this process of relaxation, of putting more bosons together, is what we used in order to create these suites. So we put one boson in, which is one photon, and then 23,000 more bosons yeah, are coming in. So we can amplify, if you like, uh, light by a factor of 23,000. This is a very large amplification number, but the process behind it is actually this, uh, this uh, affinity of bosons to a boson which is at the lower state. They all go and occupy the same state in the system. And that's what we use in order to embed this kind of strong nonlinearity in the system which allows for this single photon suite and application. Mm. Cool, cool. Well, um, I actually have a T-shirt at home uh, with this table, you know, depicting bosons and fermions and everything. And uh, I should have worn that instead of this. But although this is also pretty cool, right? <laughs> so um, going back to the chat here, uh, Cheryl is asking, and uh, maybe Darius, you can pick pick this one up. Why are you guys comparing the speed to transistors rather than fiber optics? Now that's a good one. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, in the end, uh, we want to do um, uh, classical logic with this device. So um, that's why we want to really, like, uh, that's why we are comparing uh, this um, to a transistor device. I mean, in the end, yes, I mean, uh, we are using uh, light. And, uh, of course, these uh, switches that we have here could be potentially useful in the future also for... Uh, uh, optical communications but uh, I mean of course in the long term what we envision is also really to like uh, build uh, like uh, 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 like uh, some a uh, few gates or so out of these devices so um, that's why maybe mm -hmm. Pablo, if you want to also comment on this so uh, what's your take yes uh, so 
uh, an optical fiber, people understand optical fibers, it carries, you know, an optical signal and can do this very fast with the speed of light in the optical fiber. But actually, in an optical fiber, you cannot, or so far, you cannot integrate uh, something that manipulates the information that you carry. So you send photon down an optical fiber and it is like a hose. It will come out from the other end. But what we are doing now, so fibers are good for optical interconnects, if you like. But what we are doing, we are using light to interact with liquid light, with these polaritons, in order to uh, create transistors, switches, that then you can put together. And as we demonstrated already, you can put them together in logic gates. So back in 2019, we saw that we can use light to uh, and in an architecture that brings in logic gates such as AND and OR logic gates. Fundamental logic gates which allow you to do logic. And if you want to process information or to make a calculation, you need to have logic. Just funneling light is not enough. You need to be able to, to use it for processing of information as well. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Pavel. That's that's cool. And uh, um, there's a, a question here in, in the chat for uh, for Darius actually from Timur, and Timur is asking um, from the fabrication point of view, could such type of the switch be produced from any organic materials? Is the fabrication of the structures cheap? And actually, before you answer, um, I'll also uh, I'm also kind of curious. Uh, you know, in terms of this organic polymer material, it could be rather fragile, right? So would that be also a problem to build actually reliable devices? Yeah, so um, yeah, so this goes back to uh, decades ago. So start, we can like maybe uh, think of like um, OLED TV. So I mean, th this technology was started 30 years ago or so. And back then these uh, materials, these organic materials, which are, I mean, rather, I mean, also go in the same direction. I mean, they, they were also like lasting only like uh, for a few hours, even if that, you know, and then this technology over all these years, it really matured to the point where we can really like uh, go and buy a TV, which is like last for 10,000 hours now. Now, this is exactly uh, th this technology was really over years of, of research where like fabrication has to had, really had to be mastered also like encapsulation techniques and also material properties of this. But that holds true also for our material here, which is uh, an organic polymer. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, this is um, like uh, it's still at the research uh, level. But I mean, at the moment, even th this material is like uh, uh, like we have now. It's really good enough, like the, these time scales that we are using it for, that we can really work on these fundamental physics and really explore the the the, the uh, there like uh, what's possible with it and what kind of maybe gates or like uh, physics we could uh, see or uh, establish. Now uh, coming to the question about uh, the uh, uh, is it uh, like is this only this material is possible? Well, no. I mean, these materials are really uh, tailor crafted for a specific reason. There are fundamental reasons for that. So first of all, it has to support these uh, uh, light matter interactions, and there are specific conditions for that. So uh, 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 as we discussed before, we use polaritons. So this means like light is interacting with the uh, uh, with the medium there, and that medium. Has, to, has specific properties, so meaning that uh, it has to so, uh, support uh, uh, this interaction with this light. So, and there are also other limitations, like uh, to uh, well, there, there, there are specific stores that it has to be on uh, at room temperature, so that there are also some uh, physical conditions that apply. But in the end, like from fabrication point of view, we are still developing of it, it, and like the the, the it, like in OLEDs. Well, we really have to look at this uh, encapsulation of this material, how we can also make it stable. And uh, yeah, so I believe that in the future, I think that this could be also very well um, developed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. And, um, uh, sorry, just wanted to fully answer the question. Was that, uh, is it uh, cheap? I think it was also like, uh, the, 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 so, you know, it, it's really at the fundamental level, you know, so I mean, uh, you couldn't like, it. it, it, it it's it's not it's i mean one still needs to invest uh, into this work uh, to be able to do so we need really to in, uh, engineer like this encapsulation techniques and then then really like engineer this uh 
cavities that we use in our device that they are supporting. They are like this fabrication techniques. They work together with this active material that we use that it's, you know, a, 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 they can like, uh, you know, we could make them together so they don't conflict with each other. So, yeah, so yeah, so this is more or less my take on that. But I mean, in, in the future perspectives, I see that uh, there is really a way, a lot of what we can learn and also especially from like other research fields which were developed for decades now. Yeah, great. Um, actually, somebody here is asking, um, well, you answered part of the question already, uh, how robust is the organic material? So you answered that. The second part of the question from from uh, from this guy uh, with a really cool nickname, Bruce, Bruce Billis, interesting, reminds me. <laughs> it reminds me and many others of a famous actor, of course. Um, anyway, He's asking, does it age well? It ages uh, better than most of the materials that we have been using in the last 20 years in uh, organic polaritonics. So uh, IBM, uh, in collaboration with uh, the University of Wuppertal, have done an amazing job to make some of the best uh, organic microcavities, as we call these devices, organic uh, devices uh, in the world so far. So we can... Uh, to answer the question in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a researcher, we can be working on this. We have been working on this device for many years, and uh, it is still uh, working as uh, as in day one. So, Professor uh, Ulrich Sef, uh, he 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 really uh, he really managed to engineer an amazing molecule, which is extremely photostable and has enabled this field because as we started the discussion earlier, IBM demonstrated this kind of coherent wave of liquid light, the first liquid light droplet back in 2014, using this particular device, this particular uh, sample that we are using up to now. When it comes to organic uh, LEDs, organic displays, they age and sometimes they even age faster than the device that we are playing with now. There is another question that has come, an interesting one, from uh, Jan Blomart and Lerner Dude. If, if you are interested, Katia, to to to. to. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. So why don't we go to that? So uh, why don't you tell us how fast is the amplification process? Mm -hmm. So th there is uh, there is uh, yes. So the amplification process takes place in a sub picosecond time scale. So this is less than one trillion of, uh, of, of, of a second. So if you want it, for example, to see it in terms of frequency, one less than, uh, faster than a terahertz, if you like, yes. So we can switch on the amplification very fast. Uh, the limitation on the switch, on how fast the switch can be, it is not on the switching on, which is practically instant for anything that we can interface with. Uh, but it is on the switching off, which takes a bit longer, and that's really where we say that it, you know, it can go up to one terahertz. But if we were, if the switching on was as fast as the switching off, we could go to multiple terahertz, yes, uh, as operating uh, frequencies for this kind uh, of switch. And that relates to this uh, interesting question that came from Lerner Dudetti, which is this could be used for something that requires low latency. Uh, potentially, yes. Uh, you would need to be able to interface in the right way with it in some way that you can read and write the signal as fast at least as the switch is switching on and off. Cool. Okay. Well, in the last uh, five minutes, I, I guess it uh, would be good to talk about the history a little bit of uh, optical computing because uh, the, um, Darius mentioned previously that, you know, of course, this research on optical circuits has been going on for, for quite some time. So how is how is this research different? Like if you were to sum up uh, what you've done now, uh, you know, based on what's been done by other researchers and uh, you guys as well in the past few years, what is the actual kind of breakthrough here that is different from everything else? Darius? Yeah, so I mean, um, people were using uh, now like uh, light matter interactions as well for this, but they're mostly also used in weak light matter coupling regime, so-called. Here in the sense, we use these quasi-particles, polaritons, which work in a strong light matter interaction regime, as we discussed before. And um, yeah, I mean, we really like the, the breakthrough and um, this, this, this ability to, to, to really push this towards this uh, 
super low energy consumption uh, per transistor is really a key and that enables next steps where we could imagine like having multiple of these transistors um, uh, together working. Yeah. And what, what are the main challenges, uh, would you say, right now in, in, in these optical switches? Yeah, so, so, the, the, the are, so first of all, of course, one is the material. There we are actually working uh, with the, the uh, or also with Pablos, and we are working also other mo materials such as perovskite. We also, perovskites that we also had recently, uh, a nature article there, uh, that we could maybe use other materials that are maybe more suitable uh, towards, uh, for using these applications more, in general, like to increase this light matter interaction, so making this process even like maybe easier to use, but also like uh, integrating these devices. I mean, we need to be able to connect them together somehow. So, for example, coupling these two different transistors. So, also on this, we had like a, a paper also recently uh, where we showed like uh, wave guys that uh, that we could envision that we could use uh, how to couple these transistors together. So, uh, and in general, like the, the power consumption, like uh, how we could not, not, not only like the switching, but also power budget. I mean, it's the challenge is really how to reduce that because we are still now, uh, the total power budget is still millions of the photons, uh, but uh, I mean, we still are able to switch them, but maybe reduce them. Uh, and then like, of course, in the fabrication point of view, that's what really where the advancement has to be done such that we really could like, uh, integrate them and uh, like uh, have uh, uh, several uh, uh, several of them together mm -hmm. okay cool um and just i guess um again maybe to talk about the applications a bit more so i i know we touched on this before but uh i'm, I'm sure lots of people are you know interested in uh where it's actually going to go right so can we use it in computers or telecom devices? Uh, what are other possible applications if you could just kind of reiterate and sum it all up? So who wants to take it, uh, Pavlos? That is up to you. <laughs> Make your mind. I mean, we can switch. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, uh, so really the work that we are presenting in this nature publication and uh, you can keep Darius on the, on, the, on the chat here in case he wants to add. Uh, is the it's the outcome of uh, many years of research on the fundamental science that underlies the processes that we discussed and uh, talking of applications it is uh, we are realistically for the next five years we are working together with IBM and several other European partners uh, in uh, creating a race of these switches yes as I showed you previously on this uh, on this image to connect several of these droplets. We are working to connect several of these droplets both for logic circuits, which we discussed, so optical computing in the sense of logic, but we are also connecting this kind of liquid light droplets for a different type of computation, which is called analog computing. Uh, there is a class of problems in nature where there is no intuition that can give you the answer. It is not about solving it, as we say, algorithmically. Yeah, You need to have to try different solutions and then find the one that solves the problem. Um, and for this kind of problems, we are using what is called the simulator. And uh, a simulator is a completely different, like quantum simulators, a completely different class of computers that solve particular problems. So with liquid light, we are also creating a range of droplets in order to uh, really map on this system complex problems that scale exponentially as you increase the number of variables in computation time, which are completely intractable with current supercomputers, and try to really make this liquid light computing uh, to give us, to help us to find answers to these complex problems. So if you like, liquid light computing has two arms. One is on logic optical logic, optical computing, as we discussed so far, but it is also on simulation and quantum simulation for solving non-algorithmic problems in the simplest terms. Cool, great. Uh, this is perfect. Um, we are out of time, but thank you so much, guys, for a fantastic discussion. Thanks to our experts in the chat and, uh, of course, to the audience that joined us from around the world. And uh, 
people in the audience, please do send us your comments, ideas, suggestions uh, for future webinars as well. You can find me on Twitter. You can find uh, both uh, experts here uh, on Twitter as well. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you and goodbye.